Hi, I wanted to let you know that I have a brand new, totally free masterclass available and I'd love if you wanted to check it out. It's about an hour long and it goes over three simple things that every dog owner needs to know in order to teach a dog quickly and easily without pain, force, a major time investment or fancy equipment. When you register, you'll also get a free 20 page ebook all about what I call the dog training triad. You can find it at anniegrossman.com slash masterclass. And now for something completely different. Hi, my name is Annie Grossman and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. In my career as a professional dog person over the last 10 years or so, I have developed some weird sub-interests, some of which are kind of gross. For instance, over the last few years, I've thought a lot about how we carry dog poop. I have thought deeply about poop bags and poop bag accoutrements. I have also thought a lot about certain dead animal body parts, and no body part of any dead animal has taken up quite as much brain space for me as the bully stick, which is a dried bull penis that dogs love to chew on, particularly as someone who has sold many bully sticks in her life, I have often found myself in the awkward position of having to explain to people that it really is made out of a dried bull penis, which it's a conversation that has just (laughs) concluded with giggles many, many times. Also, I always think it's like dogs really haven't made, you know? I mean, if you are literally consuming another species' genitals, I think you are the evolutionary winner here. And it's not even like the dog had to kill the animal. We're just giving it to the dogs because we love them. Anyway, a few years ago, I felt like, you know, I have fielded so many questions about bully sticks. I need to educate myself a little bit about bully sticks Really, what are they actually? What part of the penis are they? Are they really penises? Is it like some sort of like tendon that's like penis adjacent? I don't know a lot about bull anatomy. So I like spent an hour or two on Google and I wrote a blog post called Do You Know What a Bully Stick Is? And there must be a lot of people who are Googling what is a bully stick because this blog post probably has been read by more people than I've read anything else I've ever (laughs) written. And I did my best, really just from Google searching, to try and figure out everything I could about bully sticks. But that was like seven or eight years ago, and I felt like I wanted to update my research on what a bully stick is, especially as I'm now with an online store and a physical store. We're selling a lot more bully sticks than ever before. And I'm also just like trying to be more conscientious about everything that we sell in our online store and our actual store. I just, I feel like with all the craziness in the world right now, one thing we can do at least is be thoughtful about what we're consuming or what we're selling. So I emailed and called Best Bully Sticks, which is a site I have ordered from many a time. And they're great. They have, you can get bulk bully sticks. They have good deals. But I just, I couldn't get anyone on the phone and I couldn't, I just felt like I was getting lost. And if I eventually found someone, I was just going to get some like, I don't know, press release or pat answer about what a bully stick is. So I looked around some more at other places that sell bully sticks and I found the website bullysticksdirect.com 
there was a phone number on the site, so I called up, and what you're going to hear is my conversation with the company's owner, Greg Claypool. He runs the company, which is based in Ray, Michigan, and it was started by his father, now retired. If you are at all squeamish or you are offended by the word penis or you're in the room with someone who may be offended by this word, this is your official trigger warning. There is a lot of talk about bovine anatomy in this conversation, but I really learned a lot of interesting stuff talking to Greg, so I'm hoping you will get something out of this conversation as well. As of this week, we are now stocking Greg's Bully Sticks exclusively in two lengths and two different widths, both at storeforthedogs.com and in our East Village shop. And we are also probably going to be starting to stock his esophagus treats and some treats that we're calling sack snacks. That name was thought up by our trainer, M. We had a a friendly competition who could figure out what we should call these treats, and I think M won. By the end of this episode, you should know exactly what sack snacks are. So I'm a second generation when it comes to bully sticks. My father was one of the original pioneers of actually bringing all natural body part chews into the American market. One of the original ones to bring pig ears over from Europe and start selling them in the early 80s. And then he got into the bully sticks. How did your father get started in this line of work? So he actually started right out of high school. He opened up a pet store and owned a couple of pet stores and was selling, you know, everything from puppies to all the treats and chews. And then an opportunity came along where there was down in Texas, one of the original company, which was Mayor Pet Products. They're pretty, they're big company. Now they have dog food and so on. My dad joined on with them and they started using all the scrap parts of the cattle that weren't getting used in the slaughter process. They found out like the hooves and a lot of these parts, the bully stick, the pizzle, the bones, it was getting grind up to do a meat meal in it. So they went and started manufacturing it and processing it and putting it into the market. And they found out that dogs really started liking it. And that's kind of how he started offering those. And then he would call around pet stores. And it was a very hard sell at the very beginning because pet stores weren't used to buying hooves and cow penises and cow ears and pig snouts and all these different things. But it was actually great because they were able to use what essentially was scrap that they were just kind of throwing out and turning it into it. So they were able to process and use pretty much 100% of the slaughter when you go through the entire process with that. What made him then think, you know, I want to go see about these unused animal body parts. Yeah, he was actually at one of the pet expos as, you know, in our industry, in the pet industry, you have Super Zoo and Global are the kind of the two big expos Mm -hmm. where everybody gets together, the big conferences. And um, while he was down there trying to source product, he seen a booth and he just started talking with a gentleman about it. That was a big cattle rancher down in Texas. And they just kind of started talking just the opportunity was available and he went down there and they bought ovens and they just started experimenting. Experimenting with some parts of the cattle that weren't being used? Yes, correct. Do you still have a pet store? Yeah, at that time he ended up actually shutting down the pet stores and then going full time into the manufacturing of these different body part items off the cows and and pigs. Interesting. So until the 1980s, you're saying bully sticks were not really a thing that dogs got to enjoy? Yes, correct. (laughs) (laughs) So those other parts were just being ground up, you said? Yep. They were just being ground up or, uh, you know, thrown away at that. (laughs) Were you aware of what your dad did for a living when you were a kid? 
Yes, um, we always had, because of they were trying different items and experimenting with different things, there would always be body parts around my house. <laughs> and, uh, there was between a femur bone or a knuckle bone or a pig ear, they would just be randomly in his office or around the house and friends would come over and they didn't understand it. I guess uh, my dad was very good with sitting down and explaining what he did. And um, at that time, it was um, he was very busy because it was a kind of explosive growth when he started calling around and distributors at the time. It became very, very popular. So it was pretty amazing that my father would made a living off of selling cow parts. Were they called bully sticks when he started selling them? Was that what people referred to them as? Because it's also often referred to as like pizzle. I'm not exactly sure back then if they originally call it a bully stick or a pizzle or what the name was. I would have to go back and see if I could find the old price list at that time that they were using. It's interesting to me how they seem like they're never called penises. (laughs) You know, like Best Bully Sticks is a site that I've ordered from many times. And I did a search on their site to see how many times it actually says this product is made from some kind of penis. And I counted one time on the entire site. Instead, we call them bully sticks or pizzle. Do you encounter people being shy about talking about what this product is actually made of? I mean, besides calling it bully sticks, a, a pizzle and stuff, they, there's also a reference to it being muscle or tendon. Is that something you've encountered, a kind of hesitancy to talk about what it actually is? Yes, there is. There's been quite a few times where um, I've just referenced it as a tendon just because of the awkwardness of when you start talking about um, it's a cow penis. And then I've been, there's been so many times that I've been in stores talking with the owners or trying to sell them and somebody would, the store owner would go to a customer, Hey, do you know what this is? And they're like, no, we buy it all the time. And there is the fact that a lot of people out there don't exactly know what that is. So there's a lot of times where I just start off, it's a tendon, and then how many people times, oh, that's growth, and they kind of throw it back on the counter into the box, because it definitely is different when you're talking about you got a cow penis in your hand. Well, technically a bull penis, but yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, bull is penis. it the, like, is the thing the actual penis, or is it some kind of, like, ligament? I mean, is it is the penis a tendon? Like, let's get graphic here. I want to know, like... <laughs> <laughs> Are we looking at like the dried shaft of an actual penis or is it some kind of thing that's inside the penis that we're looking at? Nope. It's actually 100% penis. So what happens is to kind of go into it with that is when I was saying with the, we specialize in an odor free bully stick. And so to get that, what happens is in the process just gets to show the point that it is actually a penis is because in the process, of manufacturing the bull penis is that we actually slice it open and drain out all the blood and urine out of it and then cut off the testicles. Then we drain the urine out of it to get that smell out before we start processing it. So are there some bully sticks manufactured out there where they're not doing that? Yes, correct. And that's the big difference, which people don't understand when it comes to bully sticks and buying from a company that's doing it properly, because there's actually different ways and proper ways of doing a stick. And the main difference here is one is the taking the time and the effort when we, there's a difference between there's some cheaper bully sticks in the market, and then there's premium bully sticks. So an odor free bully stick compared to a smelly bully stick, there's a difference in price, but there's a reason for that price is because to do the odor free, there's a couple extra steps in the processing of the bully stick, which is done by hand. So you have, it's a lot more, it's more labor intensive to get an odor free bully stick. And then also a lot of bully sticks manufacturers dry the bully sticks and we hang them and dry them in ovens, but there's a lot of places that actually just dry them outside in the sun. So it, when you think about that, that's very scary because of you're having flies, you're having meat 
out in the sun roasting in these very hot temperatures, depending on which country and where they're manufactured at. And that's the difference is when you get into it, you have to be very careful because of the process. And with that Salmonella E. coli, that's a big issue when it comes to any of these natural body parts. And a lot of times that happens because of the processing, they're doing it, they're cutting corners, as you would say, or trying to do a cheaper, make it cheaper instead of doing it the correct way. So when you buy bully sticks, it's worth doing the research and making sure you know where that bully stick's coming from. So you want to make sure that it is oven dried, not air dried, sounds like. You want to make sure that it's cleaned before drying. And what you're saying is also, well, from what I understand, the longer it dries, the less smelly it's going to be, right? Yeah, well, it's actually the making sure that you drain the blood and the urine out of it properly because once you cook it and then you have that smell. So when you look at an end of a bully stick, the ones that have a yellow tint to them, that means there's still urine in it. And that's where the smell is coming from when a dog starts chewing on it. It's actually a urine smell or a blood smell is letting off that offensive odor. But if you look at a bully stick that is clear at the very top, that means that the blood in the urine was cleaned out of it properly. So that's the difference when you look at a bully stick where you could really tell if it's odor free or not. If there's a yellow tint, or if it's just white. <laughs> Since we're getting into the, the nitty gritty, what happens to the testicles? Are those made into any other things? Actually, they do. So on a Bully Sticks Direct, I call it Bully Stick Ball Jerky. So what we do actually is we take the testicles, we slice them, and they turn into a jerky, a very soft, jerky. So we do use that as well. And, and once again, I, we put the name on it, Bully Stick Ball Jerky. Because once again, it kind of goes back to when I was trying to figure out a name for that, it kind of goes back to when you were asking about, are we open about actually calling it a penis or a testicle? So that was one of the things that I was trying to make. And it was tough because make a tough choice because I didn't want to say a bully stick testicle jerky. So I figured that trying to get a name that wasn't in a way too offensive, as you would say to some people. And so that's why, but we do use the testicles as well to make a jerky. Do the dogs like the bully stick ball jerky? Yes, they do. It's great for a lot of times, a bully stick is a very hard chew. So if you have, have an elder dog or a dog that's missing teeth that likes bully sticks, it's a great alternative to the bully sticks because you're still getting the dog still enjoying that part of a bully stick. It's just a different way or alternative to the regular bully sticks for dogs that can't chew on a bully stick. Is there any kind of products made from cows, from the female ones? Is there like cow udder jerky or something like that? No, I, I haven't seen anything in that case. I mean, we're pretty much the only difference, they have all the same parts except for that part, as we know. And I know there's nothing that we use with that part of a uh, female. There's now no cow vagina chews out there. No. I feel like it's there. My- <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's like, if because we live in this male dominated society, if like that's why we don't talk about the fact that these are penises. But <laughs> if, the, if they were vaginas, it would be talked about all the time. Yeah. Now, let's talk about sourcing. Where do you get your bull parts and are they treated in the same location where bulls are raised and slaughtered? So, Bully Sticks Direct sources bully sticks from multiple different countries. One of the reasons why is that there's less and less bulls in existence to this day because of artificial insemination. So they're not needing as many bulls. The majority of our product is now getting sourced from South America. And the big reason is why I would love to have all American made bully sticks. But the problem is in the United States with artificial insemination, there's less and less bulls out there to meet all the demand of how many people buy it in the U.S. market. So 
we do get a limited amount of product from the United States, and a majority of our product is coming from South America, from Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. Okay. And what do you look for when you are getting bull parts or choosing, I guess, a, I don't know, what do you call it? A farm, a processor? So I partner up with manufacturers. And so with that, it comes down to integrity as well. When you go into a lot of these countries, it's making sure that they're doing the process correctly. And the biggest concern with bully sticks and manufacturing, it's no different than the meat industries anywhere. It's that you have to take it very seriously because of salmonella, E. coli, and some different things that can happen through the process of doing these types of parts. And that's the cleanliness of the manufacturing facility, using stainless steel appliances, and having regulations set up to make sure that it's done properly and safely and health being healthy through the process. So when I I partner with manufacturers that have this entire supply chain together, and when I say that, it's coming down to the farming, to the slaughtering, then to the processing. So there's those three main steps. And that's one of the benefits of doing it that way is because also when I was talking about the difference between odor-free and non-odor-free is A lot of times when you slaughter cattle and you get the parts and you send them to manufacturing, a lot of time you freeze them. And then when they get to the manufacturing, you unfreeze them, then you process them. But the problem is when you do that, that blood and urine is very, very difficult to clean properly to get them odor free. So if you're able to get fresh raw material, meaning non-frozen to the processing facility, and clean them that way, that's how we're able to get 100% odor-free bully sticks. So when I try to find manufacturers to partner with throughout South America, I personally go down there, meet with them, go through there, make sure everything's done properly, and see if they are able to get that fresh material. Okay. They are shipped to you then? Yep. So after the processing, we go through and then it is shipped up here to Michigan and then we process them here. We also do a separate step as well, just to make sure is actually everything comes into the United States or to Michigan in bulk packaging. And then we process them here just as an extra cautious layer of making sure looking at all the product before we package it in bags and put it out to the market. We want to make sure that it meets our quality control before we send it out there. And that's the big difference is we're not the biggest guys in the market. There's definitely some Goliaths out there where they have all their manufacturing done and their packaging done down there, where being a smaller company, we have a premium process. We take that time to make sure that we're putting out product that's good quality that meets our standards and that nothing that's going to go out there that could any of the dogs out there. How big is uh, a bull penis before it gets chopped up into bully stick lengths? A bully stick is usually between 32 and 36 inches standard size and bully sticks are 6 and 12 inches. But when we first cut the bully sticks, it's actually very long, 32 to 36 inches, and we cut them. Well, the thing is, is that the bully stick is very large at the very top, and then it comes down to a point which is skinnier. So when you buy bully sticks, you have the option of different sizing. And everybody has their own wording for the different sizes because you, or we, you could just break it down to a small, medium, large extra large bully stick. And that's all depends on the weight and the dimensions of the bully stick itself or the density of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you compare apples to apples between say best bully sticks and bully sticks direct is that we offer 100% of the time odor free bully sticks. I mean, are they really odor free? I always tell people like it's still, (laughs) it's still an animal part. Like it still might smell. Do you feel like you can really say that they're totally odor-free or they're like less smelly than they could be? 
it just depends on the processing. There are bully sticks odor free, doesn't have an offensive odor. And once again, that all comes down to the processing of the bully stick, how well you properly clean the bully stick at the end of the day. So there is, and there's a lot of product that actually comes out of certain countries where it's very hard to make an odor free bully stick because what the cattle are grazing on with free raised or out there grazing on grass and so on. And that's one thing, but in certain countries, there's a lot of spices and plants that they're eating that actually make the process of getting it odor free a lot different. And you're seeing it. I don't know if you ever actually got a really bad bully stick as far as odor. Uh, They put it on their couch or behind a chair or something, and you don't notice that you're having that offensive odor. And there are odor-free bully sticks. Okay. You have convinced me. (laughs) (laughs) And And, you can tell I... Yeah. I've done that. This has been my life. So I, I might be rattling on a little bit more, but it's not every day that I get to talk about something that I truly love and enjoy and what I do for a living. So this is pretty amazing talking to you about this. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. So, you know, you'd say that they're normally like 36 or so inches, right? And then yes. they get cut out. So that is, sorry to get graphic, but is like the actual penis, does it start out that long or does it like when it's dried, it gets that long? Like our cow penis is 36 inches long or bull penises, I should say. They are very long, but what we do, we actually stretch them out or put a weight at the end of them to stretch them out as we put them into the oven. Some manufacturers, they lay them on racks. We personally hang them And then we put a weight at the very end of them to stretch them out. And that also helps with the drainage as I keep coming back to the process of draining out the blood and urine properly is that we hang them to make sure as we wash them, it's draining down out the tip of it. So we actually, to get to the 32 to 36 inches, that is with actually stretching them out. I'm assuming this is done after the bull is deceased. Yes, that is correct. We purchase product from the slaughterhouses. So they go through the process. So this is actually bully sticks. A lot of this is byproducts, but you would actually be amazed that the price of bully sticks continues to go up. One of the reasons why is because there are countries that actually eat bully sticks, that actually buy them and eat them as regular food. I hesitate to say it, but Tell me more. <laughs> There's just countries that it's a delicacy for them. So it's no different. Is, is than, China the, the main country? Yes, it is. China is the main country that are actually buying up a lot of the bully sticks. And that's what we're competing against now is for the raw material. We're competing against China because they come in there and buy it from the slaughterhouses um, themselves. And that's what's been driving up the price. I mean, bully sticks are not a cheap product. Over the years, that is the reason why is because there's less and less bulls and more and more demand for the product itself. More and more demand because people are getting more interested in eating it themselves? Yeah, as the growth of, say, China, they're buying more and more of it. So they're trying to source and they come in there and and pay a premium price And it used to be some of these items, especially bully stick, was just a byproduct. There wasn't really a use for them. So you could get them at a a fairly good price. But now that it's becoming more of a premium product as an edible food in certain countries, that's bringing up the price. So I have to ask, have you eaten bull penis yourself? I have not. You're not curious? I'm not that curious. I mean, I've dealt with bull pizzles my entire life selling them. And that's just something that has never sparked my interest to actually try it. Okay. And you talked about them being stretched. Sometimes at the end of the bull penis, it looks like the tip. Is that really what it is? Like the tip of a, like the foreskin of a penis? Yep. It's the end. We call it it's the end skin. Yep. It the, is. En- the end skin? The end so, skin. So before it's you stretch it out, how long is the non-stretched bully stick? Um, I would say about 20 to 24 inches. Oof. 
And I've seen, I mean, I know from purchasing bully sticks, you can get ones that are like thicker cuts and thinner cuts. Is that just depending on the size of the bull it came from, or does that have to do with how much it was stretched? The type of bull that it came from, and then also because it starts out thicker at the very beginning where the penis meets the testicles, and then it gets thinner as it gets further out. When you do it, that's the difference between when you buy a small stick to a monster bully stick you're buying the first cut. So the skinny one is usually connected to the end skin and the thickest, biggest one is the largest where it starts off that's connected to the testicles. Interesting. Yeah, there are different sizes with bully sticks, not just a straight bully stick, but you can get them in springs or the full length canes. There's donuts out there. And so it's just different variations of a bully stick. But when you get into those different variations. They're a little bit more expensive. The reason why is because it's just more labor intensive than just hanging them, drying them, because then there's another process of, say, a spring. You have to actually take the bully stick and wrap it around a pole, and that's how it gets the spring look to it. The curled bully yep, stick, the- or the then there's braided ones that, I guess, is someone's job to braid them. There's people who actually make walking sticks for people out of bully sticks. Yeah. I've used ads expos before. I've had the 36 inch bully stick where I've kind of just had it and leaned it up, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> sat there and used it pain as I'm standing there to take some pressure off my feet. So I've definitely used that as well. So yeah, there's definitely different variations. I've never seen it actually. Somebody use it and promoted it that way. So that's pretty interesting. I'm going to have to do some research later on that myself. And it also looks like on your site that you sell pig penises. Is that right? Yes, correct. Tell me more, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are they okay. as, are, is there a reason they're not as popular and well-known? And, and, and what do we call a pig penis if we can't call it a bully? I call it a pig pizzle because, as you say, there's a lot of different variations. So it, it's still the penis of a pig, but they're much smaller. You don't The length, the thickness of them. They're not like a bull. I don't think they're as popular because of or a heavy chewer. They go through them a lot quicker. They're great for small dogs. As far as if you're looking for a chew that's longer lasting, a pig pizzle is definitely a great option for you. Interesting. That's yeah. the same process as the cow is the same process, but those ones are pretty much you're not able to get those odor free because they're not large enough to cut open and split and clean properly. So it's a much harder process. And I just don't know if there's anybody out there that has an odor free pig pizzle. Okay. And you also sell turkey tendons? Yes. Tell me about turkey tendons. They look like rawhide little, I don't know what you call those, like straws. Yeah, this is actually non-rawhide. That's the great thing about the turkey tendons. The turkey tendons have been amazing. I have not come across the dog yet that has not liked the turkey tendons. They absolutely love them. And the process is, once again, is that uh, with the turkey tendons, they're they're rawhide-free, 100% digestible, single ingredient, So the turkey tendons are more of a jerky than a chew. So it's more of, I categorize like bully sticks as a chew and the turkey tendons are more of a treat. Right. Because they eat them. It's not like they're lying in bed working on it for an hour. Yep, exactly. And that's the big difference is that just educating people and getting the information out there is because people are still not fully know the difference between a treat and a chew. And a lot of times I see that by the feedback, people expect like a turkey tendon to be more of a chew. So it it just really depends on the type of product, but that's the why bully sticks are so popular because as far as a single ingredient, all natural, fully digestible treat, there's nothing else out there that's going to last as long as a bully stick. And what's going on with um, your moo taffy? What is that? Yeah, moo taffy is 
the esophagus. So that's a great chew. I would say that's a product that's right between a treat. Taffy is a cheaper alternative to a bully stick. It's a, still a chew. It's not going to last as long, but the process of when you they actually really have to work on it. So that's a cheaper alternative to a bully stick. If a bully stick is just out of your price range, or you're not getting enough of them and you want to treat in between there, I would definitely always re- recommend Moo Taffy. So I know your parents are retired now. I'm curious what they think about this model that you now have of selling directly to the customer, whereas they, I, I think from what you said, I understand they were selling mostly through distributors to stores. And also what they think about the fact that bully sticks are so much more popular than they were back when they started out. Yeah, they had a tough time. That was the transition from the old model to the new model. And my dad started in it the way that they did business. And especially in the pet industry where distributors played a pivotal part with selling a lot of times when I was doing sales for my parents' company through my life is we would sell directly to the distributors. They would sell directly to the retail stores. So the whole model of selling was different. So my dad had a tough time with the transition of the old model to the new model with the internet and going online and doing that. Tough time sort of with the actual business part of it, but are they tickled to see how popular bully sticks are? They are. My dad, it's in my, uh, as they say, it's kind of in my blood. My dad loved selling and being in the pet industry and selling bully sticks and being part of what this has become. He loves it. So it's it's great. And it gives me and my father an opportunity to still to this day, talk about product and what's going on and manufacturing and what's the new trends and what's happening. So it actually is great, not just from that standpoint, but for something that me and my dad have in common that we can sit down and have these talks about because it just, it does his eyes light up when I start talking about bully sticks and just talking about them in general. What's next for the dried animal part (laughs) to industry for dogs? Alternative protein sources. The thing is with like a cow, we pretty much use every product and manufacture them. Um, there's only so many parts, but now you're getting this seeing. Um, I've seen it with like the turkey tendons. It's alternative protein source. And it's no different than with the pet foods out there, you know, you see for a chicken or a turkey or venison. So I think that the future is offering different protein sources or different products. If it's from a turkey or a deer or and so on. So I think that's where a lot of this is moving is just different. And a lot of dogs, um, you it's good to switch up the protein that you're giving them. If you're giving them just beef, you know, just beef food and beef products, it's, it might be worth throwing in a different protein source in there as well. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I am thrilled to get so much information on this product that <laughs> I've been selling for years And I think our listeners will enjoy knowing what it is they're giving to their dogs. At the very least, I think it's good that we are giving this whole food to our dogs that is single ingredient and it's not going to waste. I'm I'm sure you would agree. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's the best part about it is less um, product that you're throwing out and being able to use in this situation, being able to use 100% of the slaughter is just amazing. I mean, just um, process of doing that. So, and then plus finding a, a product that's so rich in protein and good for animals as well. You can buy Greg's special bully sticks <laughs> and so much more at bullysticksdirect.com. Or you can also now find them at storeforthedogs.com. Two little addendums for this episode. One is after I spoke with Greg, I was wondering what kind of cows we eat. Do we eat cows or do we eat bulls? Because it sounds like there are fewer bulls than there used to be. And he explained that we actually generally eat castrated males, which are called a steer. And their penises end up being thinner than the non-crastrated males, and uh, so their penises are actually what, like, the 
junior-sized bully sticks are made from. The other thing that happened after I recorded this episode with Greg was that, of course, I then started to think about cow vaginas. I just couldn't stop myself wondering what happens with the cow vagina. Is that used for something, too? Am I some kind of awful, disgusting weirdo? Maybe? I don't know. Anyway, what I found was that there was an ancient Roman cookbook, very famous in the uh, ancient world, and in this cookbook, there is a recipe for cow vagina. All you need is some pepper, celery seed, dry mint, laser root, honey, Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by subscribing, leaving a five-star review, telling your friends, and shopping in our online store. Learn more about School for the Dogs and sign up for lots of free training resources on our website, schoolforthedogs.com.